So we're looking at John, the, the epistle of John. We're on to the, the fourth week of looking at this, this epistle. Just to remind you who this John is, although it doesn't actually say that he wrote it, it's, everybody accepts it's written by, by, by John, who was the beloved friend of Jesus, probably Jesus' closest companion while he was on earth. He was Jesus' cousin. He was the, the writer of the fourth gospel, the gospel according to John. He wrote these three epistles. We're looking at the first one. And he also wrote the book of Revelation as well. And he was also one of the, the early church leaders. He was one of the head honchos. Him and James, you know, they were the guys that, that ran the church in the early days. Uh, James, the brother of Jesus. <clears throat> so he spoke with great authority. He came from a position of great authority. If John spoke, people listened because he had great credentials. And he writes this, this epistle and he writes it to Christians in general. It's not to any specific group. Therefore, it's definitely for us. It's for us to look at this morning. And so today we're up to chapter 4. And chapter 4 really is split into two different bits, as you would realise if you, you heard the reading. The first bit is about discerning those who we should trust. And the second bit is about love. So we'll look at the first bit first and the second bit second. Not a bad idea to go for. So before we do that, let's just pray. So Lord, I, I thank you for the opportunity just to, to dig into to your word and to find out more about you and more truths maybe be revealed this morning. Lord, I pray that you'll and, and help us, Lord, to, to just be have a, an open mind, Lord, and, and clear communication to allow your Holy Spirit to speak to us this morning. Amen. So, in this first bit, John's helping the, the Christians work out who is it they should trust. When people speak, how do we determine the true spirits? And this true spirits isn't uh, over spiritual in that, in that situation. It just means, you know, people. It means people who are trustworthy. So he says to people, you know, how, how can we work out when people are speaking, when you've got a guy on the platform speaking, how should we work out whether you should trust what he says? And he did a few things during the epistle of, of, of John to, to help us. But here he says one thing. He says, if people declare that Jesus is God, if people acknowledge Jesus, then that's a good guide. That's a good place to start. But when I was studying this, I looked at it, I thought, what does this word acknowledge mean? It's a kind of like vague term, really. What does acknowledge mean? It means more than know Jesus. We're told in, in James that the demons know God, know Jesus, and tremble. So it means more than know, even though it's got the word know in it. So I went back to the Greek, which is dead easy to do. You, you look at the, the, the Greek New Testament, and you find the word, and you go to a Greek dictionary, and you pair it together, and you get the answer. And the Greek word is this word, homo logio. Homo logio. Now I think that between us here, we know enough Greek to work out what these two, two Greek words mean and, uh, separately. Homo? No. Homo means one, as in homogenous or homosexual. Or ho homo means one or just the, or the same. And logio is nearly word, but with the, the bit at the end, it means speak. So the word that's translated acknowledge here is the word homologio, same speak. And John's saying, if somebody speaks the same as Jesus, somebody acts the same as Jesus, says the same things as Jesus, that's a good place to start. If you hear somebody that's telling you stuff that's different to what Jesus says, don't trust them. Right? If they're not the same speak as Jesus, don't trust them. And the reason he says that right there is in this, this time when John was writing this, about, about 100 AD roughly is when he's writing this, there was this Gnosticism coming up that people were saying that Jesus wasn't God. They said that God visited the man Jesus at his baptism and left him just before he died on the cross. And that's not what Jesus said. 
You know what Jesus said, didn't he? Jesus says that he is God, that he and the Father are one. So they're not saying the same speak. They're not acknowledging Jesus. And as a guide for us, you know, we can take that, can't we? You know, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. If we hear people that don't say that, that don't say same speak, that don't acknowledge Jesus, that say there's other ways by what Jesus says, don't trust them. That's what Paul says here, not Paul, John. That's what John says here, you know, ignore them. You know, this is a, a, a litmus test. It's a test. To, it's not the only test. He does more stuff and he comes on the second half to show something else. But he's saying, if people don't same speak Jesus, don't act the same as Jesus, don't say the same as Jesus, don't trust them. And therefore he's saying, don't trust these Gnosticists who are saying a whole lot of stuff that isn't what Jesus said. He was getting rid of that heresy in the early church. So that's verbally. That's verbally how we can do one thing to work out who we should trust, who we should listen to. It's not the only thing. He goes on on the second half to look at practically how we can do that. John is a guy that loves love. Love, you know, if you cut him open, I'm sure like Blackpool Rock, it would just say love all the way through. You know, in his gospel, in John chapter 13, in his gospel, verse 35, he says this, by this will everyone know that you are my disciples. So I'm going to paraphrase that. Here's another way to work out if you should trust people. Here's another way to work out if you should listen to what they're talking about. Yeah, here's another test. By this will people know that you are my disciples. And what's the second half of that verse? Perfect. If you have loved one another. If you love one another. Flip that round, he's saying, if you don't love one another, why should people listen to you? You're not acting as my disciples. I mean, just listen. I'm just going to just read a few verses from, from John, from John chapter 15, when the, the, John's on his hobby horse about love. And he says this, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you this, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lays down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I have commanded. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. He said, I've called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not, in fact, I'm going to stop there. And he finishes at the end. This is my command. Love each other. It can be no doubt, if you're listening to John, the beloved disciple that he is really, really big on love. That he sees love as a key characteristic of being a Christian. <clears throat> he says in, in, in John 15 there, if you want to be a loving person, obey my commands. Just do what I say. If you do what I say, this will help you be a loving person. And not only that, he says your joy will be complete. If you want to be completely joyful, then love. And, you know, I, I read someone's thoughts on God and love as I was preparing for this. I then lost the reference, but I had copied and pasted the, the, the actual bit. So I don't know who said this, but anyway. The sun only shines just as God only loves. It's the nature of the sun to shine to offer warmth and light. And it's the nature of God to love. We are free to get away from the sun. We can lock ourselves in a dark room. 
We can, but we do not keep the sun from shining just because we put ourselves in a place where it cannot reach us. That's interesting. We can try and hide from God's love. It doesn't make God not, not loving. We can say the sun's not shining. It doesn't mean it's not shining. It just means we're not feeling it. You know, we have God being a God of love who died for us. And we know all that kind of stuff about God's love. And John says here, in fact, he says in, in verse 8, an even bigger thing, he says, you're not a Christian if you don't love which is kind of gobsmacking. You're not a Christian if you don't love. What a, a gobsmacking thing for John to say. And we can, we can tr try and hide from it. It says, you know, God's not in you. So this morning, you know, it's not a complicated message I'm trying to get across here. You know, we need to love. But look, let's get really, really practical. You know, loving is tough. Loving people is really tough, isn't it? Often is. You know, but it is an act of will. It's an act of will. It's not an act of emotion. I was at New Wine um, a fortnight ago. And before we left, uh, Stella got a phone call from Katie Porter saying, oh, could Rob just go to church and pick up the, the, um, the event shelters, the big shelters that we build? We've got two of them. Uh, and, and bring them to New Wine. Sarah tells me this, and I thought, cheeky rat, I rushed off my feet. But so much to do, and she's thought enough to phone me. Eh. <sighs> so yeah, I suppose I will, I suppose I will. So, so I'm down above the kitchen, getting the event shelf, these big heavy things, and I see a whole bunch of seats, of collapsible camping chairs. And I see them, I think, they'd be handy for new wine. I wonder who's going to get them. Suppose I've got to get them, haven't I? <laughs> Nobody else is going to do it. Got off the backside. It's going to be me. Fine, I'll do it then. So I, I get I get all the camping chairs. I, I take them to New Wine. First day we're at New Wine, where everybody's doing all the tents and getting all sorted. And I get out the the event shelters. Well, I brought them, and I put them down in the middle of of the area. We were all camped round. They're right in the middle. Sixty people can see them there in the middle. Nobody builds them. Nobody builds them. And I'm sat there thinking, I suppose I've got to build them, haven't I? I go and get them, I bring them, I carry them, I put them there, and yeah, I've got to build them as well. Where's that Steve McGannity? He's not doing it. Where's that Phil and Kate? They're not doing it. You know, I had a really lovely afternoon, I'm telling you. It's ridiculous, isn't it? And then I sat there in my, in my caravan, stewing, you know. And I thought, you know, the only reason that I could bring these tents is because a couple in church offered me their van to tow our caravan because we've not got a car that tows our caravan. So someday in church, in fact, I'll name and praise them, uh, Chris and Jackie Stevens, Chris's Wops van, he spent an entire day clearing his van out, getting rid of all his tools, washing the van, putting a carpet in it, so to make it a, a little bit presentable, it took him an entire day to do that. I could only actually pick up the, the, the event shelters because somebody had lent me their van to get me to New Wine. It took me 15 minutes to get these event shelters. I was sat at New Wine as village host. My job was to help people build things on the first day. These people that weren't around to build that event shelter, why were they not around? Because they were away helping others, doing stuff on team. That was what they were there for, working their guts out. I reflected, God, I need to change my attitude. I need to have an attitude of gratitude. It's amazing how you can see things in different ways. I was only in the position to take them down there because of love, because of somebody's generosity. It's the only reason that I was in that position. I could only get to New Wine with my, from my family because of love, because of somebody's generosity. 
And yet I managed to turn that into a selfish position. Have you ever done that? Yeah, is that possible that somebody else might manage to have that attitude problem? You know, it's so easy to have a negative attitude. Not of an attitude that's loving. Not a helpful attitude. Not a positive attitude. Not an attitude which helps move people forward. And I really want to encourage you to be people that are people that are grateful of whatever it is in life and have an attitude of gratitude and have an attitude of doing loving things. The good news is, is that you do love and normally the warm, fuzzy feelings come afterwards. The only silver lining in that story for me is I did go to church. I did pick up the event shelters. I did pick up the chairs. I did build them. But I missed out. I missed out on the wholeness of the experience because I didn't give with joy. I gave with grudgingness, you know, and that's my problem in that situation. I hadn't slept for a long time. Having a little baby is not good when you're in your 50s, I'm telling you. It is good. It is good. It is. But I remember, you know, what John says. And John says, if you want complete joy, if you want your joy to be complete, live a life of love. Now, is John wrong? So if you want to have complete joy in your life, live a life of love. It's not the only place in the Bible that says that. It says it in a few places. But I'll say that again. If you want to have a joyful life, live a life of love. Live a life of doing stuff for others. Live a life of giving. Live a life of thinking beyond yourself. If you want to be disciples of Christ, live a life of love. If you want to be a Christian, live a life of love. If you want to have complete joy, live a life of love. You know, Steve spoke a couple of weeks ago about grumpy people. I've got no idea. I've not looked at the PowerPoint once, Jane. Is the next slide grumpy old men? Yeah, there we go. Yeah, yeah. Steve spoke about uh, not being grumpy a few weeks ago. And I think we somehow give each other permission to be grumpy. And we cannot. Because we are family and because we are Christ representatives, because the key way that we can show people at our work and outside this church and in our family that we are Christians is by how we express love, we cannot allow each other to be grumpy. There is no place in church for grumpy old men or grumpy old women. There is no place in church for moaning. Just, it, this just does not exist. We have to be an individual and a collective that love. And as we grow in time with the Holy Spirit, we should be more and more loving, not less and less. We should become less fixed in our old ways and more fixed on Christ and his ways. And I want to challenge us all in that. I want to challenge you as an individual to look at ways that you are not loving and do not accept that standard. Do not accept that standard in yourself or in your friends. Do not say that's just them. They've always been like that because that is not Christianity. We are not always just like that. We cannot always just be sinful. That's what it is. You know, we have to aspire and encourage each other to be loving because, dear me, does John not push this so much? Ten past, okay. You know, this next point, I had no plan to make. I was sat there on Thursday or Tuesday. Anyway, I was sat at my computer writing this sermon, chatting to God, merrily typing away when an email came in and the email I opened it and it was from Rick Warren 
Rick Warren sends me emails all the time. Well, one a day. And this one, the reading was 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. And you go, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. <laughs> I am in the middle of preparing a sermon on 1 John chapter 4, and I'm talking about verse 18. And I get an email from Rick Warren saying, here's a thought for you about 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. I'm thick, but I say, okay, God, I'll pass that on, right? So this is Rick Warren's thoughts on this. There's no fear in love. Perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. And he says this, you're capable of far more than you understand right now. You just need someone to believe in you. I've got new, good news for you. Someone already does. When someone believes in you unconditionally as God does, it releases you to take great risks. You've unfulfilled dreams in your life because you've been scared to death to go after them. You'll die with unfulfilled dreams unless you let one truth really sink in. God loves you unconditionally. No matter who you are and no matter what's in your past, God believes in you far more than you believe in yourself. That means fear doesn't have to stop you anymore. The Bible says there is no fear in love. But perfect love dries out fear. Think you've blown it? Ready to throw in the towel of your dreams? God's love says to not be afraid and to give it another shot. And I thought, I never thought of that angle. It was never in my head. But what he's saying is we have security in God's love. We have security to reach for the stars, to go to infinity and beyond to dream the dreams to have the visions and to reach out knowing that if we fail if we don't quite get there it's fine it's absolutely fine you are loved i am loved full stop not based on your successes or your failures you know psychologists tell us that when somebody gives you a criticism it affects us. When somebody says something positive, it doesn't affect us that much. In fact, it takes 10 positive affirmations to counteract one negative uh, affirmation. That's not a juxtaposition. Uh, and the people that often say the most negative things about you is yourself. We pull ourselves down. Yet our teachers, our parents and friends can often be cruel as well. But we often judge ourselves mostly ourselves. You know, my son Joe, sadly, was at a funeral this week. One of his friends from college committed suicide a fortnight ago. He, uh, well, I won't get into the details, but, you know, for whatever reason, he felt that life was not worth living. 20 years old. Because of the pressures. 20 years old, and he didn't feel loved. His value wasn't in himself as God's child. His value was in external factors. And these external factors weren't lining up. And therefore, he felt he had no value, and he took his own life. Not surprisingly, we said to Joe, you know, Joe, you need to understand that you are loved full stop. You are valued full stop. You know, passing or failing your degree does not change who you are or what you are. If you never run another race in your life, it doesn't matter. That doesn't change that you are valued and loved. But do we believe that as individuals? Do you believe that? Or do you value yourself compared to others, compared to their achievements, their family, their looks, their whatever? Or do you weigh yourself up compared to what God says? That he loves you so much that he died for you. He has a place prepared for you. That he wants to spend eternity with you. And that nothing can separate you from his love for you. It's on that basis that you can reach for the stars. It's on that basis that you can you know, go to infinity and beyond. Because you're secure in who you are in Christ. So I want to encourage you. Do not say negative things over yourself 
or over your friends or family either. But try and see yourself as God sees you. And try and see others as God sees them. Loved, dearly loved, so loved that he died. We need to be people that are loving. So I've said roughly five things this morning. Trust people who behave like Jesus. Love each other. Do acts of love out of will, out of choice. Choose to love. Don't be grumpy. Never ever accept grumpiness in yourself or in others. And chase your dreams. We can be people that chase dreams. We have that security. You know, whatever we end up achieving or not doesn't affect who we are in Christ. We're fine. We're God's children. Let's just pray. Father, I thank you this morning for the example of your love that we can be secure in your love. But that security is not there to make us lazy, to make us selfish. It's there to make us reach out to others. Lord, I pray that Christ Church will be known as a place of love. That Southport will know that we are your disciples because of our love. That when people come into contact with individuals from this church, they will find love that we will love people even though sometimes they'll get on our nerves. We will love people even though sometimes they do things that disappoint us. We will love people even though sometimes they may steal from us. They may not be appropriate in what they do in this church, but we will still love because you loved them so much that you died for them. And Lord, I pray that we will love each other enough to hold each other to accountability, that we will not allow each of us as individuals, to be unloving. We will aspire for the highest heights of love from each other so that we can be the people you want us to be, that you need us to be, so that we can be the light and salt that you could require of us. And Lord, I pray for those in our church this today who are not with us because of our illness or other reasons, for, for Jocelyn Fenton, for Jean Dawes, for Pat Lang, Lillian Ellis, Michael Freeman. All these people, Lord, suffering with ill health. Lord, may they know that they are loved and cared for in their situation, that no matter their physical situation, Lord, their spiritual situation may be completely secure in you. There will be people that still shine out your love because your love goes beyond their physical situation. Lord, I just pray for, for those that soul survivors just now. There's about I think, 15 from the church there. These young people and the leaders. Lord, may these young people and the leaders get a new experience of you this week, a new revelation of you this week. You know, may they come back and reveal your love to us in a new way. And Lord, may we be challenged by them. Lord, I thank you for this church. And Lord, I, I just pray that we collectively can be the people you want us to be. Your church, Christ's church, here on Lord Street, being your witness to those who don't know your love yet who don't know what it means to be part of your family. Lord, help us in our mission to be that community that reaches out. Amen. <coughs> so we're going to continue and we're going to sing our, our third song, Lord, I Come to You. As we are singing this song, uh, no, that's not going to happen. During communion, I'll say this now, during communion, there will be people across on this left-hand side if you would like prayer. If there's anything that I've, I've said this morning or that God said to you, completely independent of anything I've said, and you'd like praying for this morning, during communion time, there'll be people across there, the prayer team will be across there to receive you and pray for you during communion. But let's stand, if it's convenient.